This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. It is just a pleasure to introduce this, this session in particular on genome sequencing in the clinic, promises and pitfalls. Uh, I think we're, um, as many of you may be aware, in a really uh, quite an amazing time in terms of uh, where we stand with genome technology. The, the genome, the Human Genome Project was completed just over a decade ago for many millions of dollars. and. Uh, just, I think, about a month ago, the first company announced um, the ability to generate an individual genome for less than $1,000, uh, which was really considered sort of a, an important milestone in terms of moving this technology into the clinic, uh, which is what we are going to hear about today. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jennifer Friedman. Uh, she is a clinical professor of neurosciences and pediatrics at UC San Diego. She's an expert in adult and pediatric movement disorders and has a particular interest in the application of genomics to diagnosing rare diseases. She's been uh, with UC San Diego and Rady Children's um, since 2004. And I think I've personally known uh, uh, Dr. Friedman for maybe about the last four years. Um, about four years ago, I met her when she and I worked on a research project together that involved um, trying to evaluate whether we could use genome sequencing for diagnosis of rare disease. And the very first patient we had in that study was one of her patients. And uh, I learned a lot from her uh, in that instance. Um, I learned. Uh, you know, was sort of exposed to some of the issues that come up when, you know, it's, it's not just, a, you know, uh, the letters of the genome, but you have a patient sitting in front of you and their genome sitting next to them, and how do you um, sort of use that information effectively and responsibly? Um, and since then, I've, I've, uh, I've really um, continued to learn a lot from her. I think she's um, probably the most knowledgeable uh, and um, thoughtful, I think, physicians doing work in this space. And so it is really a great pleasure to introduce her tonight. So thank you very much, Cinnamon. I, I really appreciate that. And I, and I want to um, kind of emphasize that the feeling is mutual. I think we, we all learn from each other. This is a brand new technology, and, and there is a tremendous amount um, to learn, um, sometimes some mistakes along the way. Um, so I've very much valued my interactions with Cinnamon as well. And I am, as Cinnamon said, going to talk to you a little bit about um, sequencing in the clinic. And I'm going to tell you uh, stories of several of my patients to try to illustrate the promise of, of sequencing as well as some of the um, pitfalls or mistakes that can happen along the way. And then hopefully we'll have a nice discussion at the end what your thoughts are. We can all learn from you as well. I think there are no necessarily right answers um, uh, at this point. So. I'm a neurologist primarily. I work at Rady Children's Hospital. And many of the patients that I have seen um, have undergone extensive evaluations in search of a diagnosis and a cure. The parents and the um, patients are often desperate for answers. And with increasing awareness in the public of the promise of genome sequencing to um, uh, identify problems in our genetic blueprint that may be associated with disease, families are increasingly requesting this testing in the diagnostic workup of their child. And with the plummeting cost, as Cinnamon mentioned, this is increasingly becoming a reality for many of our patients. Um, this slide shows and illustrates that uh, drop in cost below $1,000. 
But um, what's not really apparent here in this slide is though the cost of the sequencing itself has dropped dramatically, the interpretation remains complex and costly. How to accurately transmit the complex data to the physician caring for the patient has been the subject of much discussion and controversial guidelines by the American College of Medical uh, Genetics. But what issues may confront the clinician who must distill really complicated data to their patients when the physicians themselves may not even understand the details is a topic that really hasn't been well addressed. So I hope to show you with some of these examples the promises and some of the stumbling roadblocks that may crop up along the way. And I'll start with the promise. Um, and the first two patients that I'd like to introduce you to um, are twins, Noah and Alexis. And I should mention that I have permission to show their pictures as well as use their names. Shortly after the birth of these twins, their parents noticed that something was wrong. They were very fussy, irritable, they didn't sleep well, they had trouble eating, and it soon became clear that their development was delayed as well, with neither walking until close to their second birthday. The source of their developmental delay was unclear, and so the family um, embarked on an odyssey of really unrelenting tests. This slide shows the appointments and testing that Noah and Alexis endured during their first six years of life. And the details here are really not um, important. I just show this slide to illustrate the magnitude of testing that was done in search of an answer. And eventually, based on some abnormalities on one of Noah's MRIs, a diagnosis of cerebral palsy was made. But it soon became clear that this diagnosis was wrong because at around age five, Alexis began to lose skills. She began to have increasing difficulties with her motor movements that were most apparent late in the day. And during that time, especially in the late evening, she would have trouble uh, using her arms to feed herself. She was having trouble sitting and ha having trouble um, talking. She um, uh, had increasing difficulty eating, was losing weight, and the family thought, was afraid that she was going to die. So I'm going to show you a very short video of Noah and Alexis at age five, just to show you what they looked like. And I don't know um, if you can see, but there's some posturing um, in Alexis's arms that we call dystonia. Um, Noah really doesn't show apparent symptoms in this, um, in this video. Um, they're doing some jumping jacks, and you can see in contrast that uh, Alexis has more symptoms than Noah does. And then the next clip will be in the evening. She would have spells um, where her muscles would stiffen and tremor. And she had trouble speaking, and um, she would have trouble standing up um, as well. And so the family was, was distraught and um, uh, continued to search and search for answers. And eventually their mom, um, who was scouring the internet, stumbled across a story of a little boy who had symptoms very similar to Alexis. And mom realized that the um, worsening of symptoms that Alexis experienced in the evening was very characteristic of disorders due to a deficiency of the chemical messenger dopamine. So you may be familiar with dopamine because this is the chemical messenger that is missing in the more common adult disorder Parkinson's disease. And the child that Noah and Alexis's mother read about was cured when he was treated with a medication that replaces dopamine in the body, and that medication is Cinemet. So this medication, Cinemet, was used in Alexis and eventually Noah, and the majority of their symptoms were dramatically reversed. And I'm going to show you just a little video of Alexis only. After a short time on Cinemet, um, her coordination is markedly improved. Um, and you'll see in a moment her speech is also markedly improved. Do you want to buy some Girl Scout cookies? Please. She's very cute, too. 
So as you can imagine, the family was really overjoyed with um, these results, and they thought their kids were cured. And in fact, they really did very, very well. They um, uh, got good grades in school. They excelled athletically um, until the age of 13. And at age 13, Alexis again took a turn for the worse. She began to develop increasing breathing problems that made it impossible for her to participate in athletics and at times were so severe that she would turn blue and need to be transported to the emergency room. So the family again was quite um, distressed and began their second uh, diagnostic odyssey. So again, there was a great amount of testing and again, there were no answers. And so this family turned to a research study. And at, time, at this time, when this was done, it was only available at research for research um, uh, genome sequencing. And through this research study at Bail Baylor Medical College, um, the DNA was examined letter by letter until a mistake in the DNA code was identified. And the mistake, actually two mistakes, one on each copy from mom and one from dad, were in the sepiapterin reductase gene. And mistakes in this gene are responsible for a very, very rare condition called sepiapterin reductase deficiency. And once this biochemical defect was understood, the therapy could be tailored directly to this underlying abnormality. And so it was recognized that Alexis and Noah were missing not only dopamine, but also serotonin. Serotonin is related neurotransmitter to dopamine. And though the dopamine was being replaced by Cinemet, the serotonin deficiency was not being addressed. And therefore, a medication called 5-HTP, which is actually available over the counter, was added to replace the missing serotonin. And on this combination therapy, both twins showed benefit. Most notably, Alexis's breathing problems dramatically improved and almost entirely resolved. Noah showed improved handwriting and coordination. And both twins showed improved focus um, and attention in school. And so through this single blood test that they had had, these children received a definitive diagnosis, the end of a diagnostic odyssey, as well as optimized therapy that was designed just for them. And though at the time the cost of the genome sequencing was quite high, it in no way compared with the cost that had been uh, mounted by this family over the preceding 14 years. And obviously the benefits speak for themselves. But these children and their, their journey represent in some ways the ideal for sequencing because they received a definitive diagnosis, there was a identified treatment, and for mo all intents and purposes, a cure. But there are several reasons that this case was ideal. The diagnosis was definitive because the mutations, the changes in the DNA, were in a known human disease gene. We'd seen this gene before. The changes in the DNA were changes that we had seen before, so we knew that they caused disease. And the symptoms that the twins had matched what we already knew about this disease. So we were able to make a definitive diagnosis. And to make things even more ideal, there were effective treatments available based on what we understand about the biology as well as based on prior patients. But things aren't always this ideal. For many patients, there are gaps in the path from undiagnosed to cure. And as we identify through sequencing more and more unusual conditions and new genes, the diagnosis, though really important and really our initial goal, is often really only the first step in a long road toward achieving what is really important for these patients, which is treatment or cure. And so for many of these patients, we now need to reach out to researchers to really help us interpret results and also begin the steps, long and hard and many steps, toward developing therapies for these patients. In addition to this sh shortfall, lack of available therapies, there may be also many misdirections and wrong turns that may occur as we are trying to interpret sequences and make diagnoses, as we're going to see in the next patient. 
So this next patient, um, she is a 19-year-old girl who uh, came to me with a tremor that had been present since she was 13. The tremor interfered with her writing and at times was present in her head as well. And in retrospect, she was noted to be clumsy in childhood, as was evident on her examination. This video um, shows her handwriting, and as you can see, it is quite labored and tremulous, and you can see the, the output of her handwriting is quite below what it should be for, for a 19-year-old. And this is quite limiting to her, as she is a, a college student. She was treated with multiple medications, a few of which had some mild benefit for her. Um, and like twins, Noah and Alexis, she had MRI studies, and she underwent numerous blood and urine tests. And eventually, with all of that negative, we did turn again to sequencing. Now, this is 2014, and at that time, sequencing was available in the clinical setting, so we <coughs> no longer needed to use a research lab for sequencing. We were able to send it off like any other lab test. So we had great hopes for the sequencing, but unfortunately, the results came back that they were unable to identify any abnormalities that were consistent with her disease. What they did notify us of, however, were um, VUS, and I don't know who, um, some of you may be familiar with this term and some of you may not. So VUS stands for Variance of Uncertain S Significance, and this means we don't know. There were two genes identified with variants of uncertain significance, and these are changes in genes that we just don't have enough information in 2016 to interpret. And these VUS are really the bane of my existence, the bane of anyone who deals with sequencing's existence because they create lots of work and great confusion and uncertainty for physicians and for patients. And we're gonna talk hopefully some more about VUS. So what do I do when I get VUS, which happens all the time? I dive into the literature, I learn what I can about these genes. I'd never heard of these genes, well, didn't know much about these genes before. Um, I learn what I can about the biology. I learn whether there are any animal models that may um, resemble my patient. And most importantly, I see if there are other patients that have been described with symptoms that are similar to my patient. And after all of that review, I ultimately dismiss these as not being relevant to my patient. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but that was my judgment. So our next step was to turn now to a research lab, now 2015, to do um, exome sequencing and, and what's called low-pass genome sequencing, um, a little bit more detailed look. And for a number of reasons, um, in a research lab, the sequence can be examined a little bit more deeply. And because there's a little bit less stringency on the restrictions of reporting, less robust findings can be considered and discussed. And so the first result that came out of that research lab was the same as the clinical lab, and that is nothing. Um, and that really prompted the researchers to look harder and they did, um, uh, and from that came, again, two variants of unknown significance, this time in the MBP gene. Again, we looked into this gene and associated conditions, didn't feel that this was related, um, a good fit for our patient, and so this was dismissed back to the research lab, scrutinize the sequence, see if they can find anything else that they can plausibly think might be related to the symptoms in my patient. And in so doing, they came up with two variants in a gene called CFTR. Now, some of you might know what this gene is. The CFTR gene, um, when two mutations are found, is associated with cystic fibrosis. This, as most of you know, is a devastating childhood degenerative lung disorder that leads to progressive disability and early death. And in fact, it is the most common fatal genetic disease in the US, occurring in one in 3,000 births. So why did the research lab report back mutations or variants at that time, we're not sure, 
in a gene that's associated with a lung disorder and really does not have neurologic symptoms. And I didn't know much about CF other than what you know because I'm a neurologist and I don't treat patients with CF. So the hypothesis of the lab was as follows, that CF can be associated with um, dysfunction of other organs other than the lungs. There can be malabsorption, and with malabsorption can come vitamin E deficiency. Vitamin E deficiency, in turn, can be associated with neurologic problems, such as tremor and other things that were seen in our patients. So this hypothesis was a reasonable one. It was quite a stretch, but if you remember, we were really digging deep to see if we could find anything at this point. And it was ultimately not correct, as the vitamin E level in our patient was normal. So now we had more than one problem. We had a neurologic problem without a diagnosis, and we also didn't know what to do with these CFTR variants. Does our patient also have cystic fibrosis? Well, I knew enough to ask about pulmonary symptoms. Um, she has very mild asthma, but no other pulmonary symptoms. And from that, we know that she doesn't have the classic form of um, uh, severe early onset um, cystic fibrosis that most people think of when they hear the term cystic fibrosis. Now, she may have what is now being termed CFTR-related metabolic syndrome, which is a milder set of symptoms that can occur with mutations in these genes, um, may involve pulmonary and other symptoms. The other possibility is that um, uh, since we don't routinely screen the population who is healthy for CFTR, um, mutations, that it is possible that she does have two CFTR mutations, and other people may carry CFTR mutations and never develop cystic fibrosis due to other protective factors that we just don't understand. So we really don't know quite what this means. And so the first step is to really look at the variants that were identified and see what's known about these. Are these um, things that have been seen in cystic fibrosis patients before, or are these completely new and we really don't know what they do? So each of these variants is, is given a number based on the location in the gene. And the first one, the G551D, that one was easy because that one is a known pathogenic cystic fibrosis mutation. That has been associated with many patients with cystic fibrosis, and it's one of the most common. The other, the S42F uh, variant, has been seen in a few patients with cystic fibrosis, but really not enough for us to be conclusive. And so really the significance remains unknown. And so, she has been referred to pulmonology, and she's gone, going to undergo more definitive testing. One of those tests is called a sweat chloride test to try to understand what this really means for her. And so what is the impact of these findings on the patient and the family? And one of the first impacts is, is do we really care? Is it important to know? She clearly has no pulmonary or minimal pulmonary symptoms. And it may be important to know. So for patients who have cystic fibrosis, there may be benefit to preventative screening, early and aggressive treatment of infections. And in fact, there is a drug available, Ivactifor, just for patients with her mutation. Now, nobody is suggesting putting an asymptomatic patient on a medication for cystic fibrosis but we don't know. We don't know if that would be helpful to her. So many, many open questions. And with that, for this family, unfortunately, in our search for a diagnosis for her neurologic problem, we have created a lot of fear and uncertainty regarding an unrelated problem. So this, these actually have a name these types of findings, and depends who you are, what you want to call them, but some of the names used are secondary findings, off-target findings, or incidental findings. And how to handle these is really a hotly debated topic, both among clinicians, laboratories, researchers. And on the one hand are the genetic libertarians. And they say, give every, everybody has a right to all of their data, give patients 
all of the variants regardless of how well we understand those. On the other hand are the genetic empiricists, and their view is to report only the clearly defined variants that are related to the presenting condition. And that is to avoid exactly what may have happened with our patient, which is the psychologic burden of becoming a patient in waiting, <coughs> waiting for symptoms to occur, it may never occur, as well as perhaps some possible iatrogenic harms of unnecessary screening. And so to really mediate between these groups, the American College of Medical Genetics has come out with a consensus statement. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a bit controversial because not everybody agrees. But they have come up with a list of 56 genes called the ACMG56 that they suggest that clinical laboratories offer patients the ability to choose to have results returned if variants are found in these 56 genes. And these 56 genes have been chosen because they are genes for which something can be done. So cancer genes, for example, where enhanced screening ahead of time may help someone in the long run. Um, different types of disorders where early identification and treatment may benefit someone in the long run. And so these are called actionable genes, genes where we will actually create some action or some treatment if we know that there are mutations in those genes. So most laboratories will follow this guideline. Most uh, or some will actually offer more than the 56 uh, based on what they think are actionable, because again, there is not complete consensus. But who really is the one who makes the choice? Well, the choice whether to receive these or not is um, uh, embedded in the consent forms of um, the clinical testing labs for um, uh, the genome or exome sequencing. So going back to the consent form for our patient, turns out she actually opted no. No, she did not want to receive these results. And that is why the CFTR did not turn up on the clinical testing, but it did turn up on the research testing because they had a plausible link to the neurologic disorder. The research lab did, so they reported it, whereas the clinical lab did not make the link, and they felt this was an off-target finding and chose not to report it back. And so inadvertently, we have given the patient a result that maybe she didn't want. The other thing that comes up is when she, this form was signed, she was a minor, and now she is an adult. And um, a lot of the um, uh, um, uh, decision um, capacities may change, um, and uh, what decision one might make may change as one becomes an adult. So these are all issues um, that uh, come up when we are trying to decide what results to return, who decides the child who's a minor or the parent. So while we were struggling with all of this, it's now 2016, two years after we had sent the first clinical exome. To our surprise, we got a fax from the um, clinical lab that they had reanalyzed the original um, sequence that they had um, uh, reported essentially no definitive diagnosis and two variants of unknown significance. And in their reanalysis with more powerful bioinformatic tools, they were able to find two mutations in the ADCK3 gene. So this was actually good news because the ADCK3 gene uh, mutations are associated with a disorder um, that is associated with coenzyme Q10 deficiency. This is a vitamin cofactor deficiency and in some cases may be treatable with coenzyme Q10 and the symptoms match those of our patient. So we feel pretty confident that this is the correct diagnosis for our patient, and we have started her on coenzyme Q10. And so in effect, we have now, hopefully, we don't know how she'll respond, but we have hopefully found not only her true diagnosis, but for her neurologic symptoms, but also a targeted therapy, which was our goal all along. 
but we're still left with these CF variants now as well. And we don't quite know where that is going to lead. And so hopefully by showing you how an ideal case as well as a very complicated case with many twists and turns and maybes and no's and yeses, I have um, given you just a flavor of some of what we do when we're trying to um, uh, interpret uh, sequences um, and interpret information that is given to us from a clinical uh, lab or a research lab and then try to distill that information for patients. And so there are many, many questions that arise. These questions center around three main topics, the variance of uncertain significance, the negative exomes, and off-target findings. And so with the variance of uncertain significance, questions to think about are whose responsibility is it to determine the significance or not? Is it the lab, the physician, or somebody else? Whose responsibility to reevaluate over time is it anyone's responsibility to do that? The lab, the physician, or someone else? And who's to pay for that? There is no funding mechanism for that. Um, for the negative exomes, should the lab be re-examining these? Should they be reporting new findings over the time? And should this be mandatory? Should it be optional? And who should pay for it? Again, no funding mechanism. And what about these off-target findings? Should variants unrelated to symptoms be returned? What if the variants are associated with a disease that has no treatment? What if the variants are associated with a disease with a potential intervention, but that intervention doesn't um, become relevant into adulthood? Should the parents be able to request such information on their minor children? For example, a BRCA1 mutation would be one of the genes in the ACMG56. Do we really want to know that about a two-year-old? Um, what implications might this finding have if these were part of newborn screening? And we had, for example, found two CFTR possible mutations in a newborn. How might we treat that newborn differently, and would that be the right thing to do? So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and, again, your patience at the beginning. Um, and I hope to have a very interesting discussion, and I hope to learn from you some of your thoughts on this, because as I said at the beginning, there really are no right answers. Um, and I think we all are in this to learn together. So thank you very much. So uh, as you all are uh, jotting down your questions on a card. One thing, maybe I'll just kind of start off the discussion with one thing I was really struck by um, when you were talking about um, variants of unknown significance. And in the, in the beginning, you also alluded to um, sort of issues related to uh, how we return these findings uh, to patients and the pressures that are on healthcare providers, maybe particularly physicians. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the instance when you know, they may not feel uh, all that comfortable with the findings themselves. Um, so you, you made a comment, you said, um, so when, when t then s talking about the VUSs, you said, so the first thing I do when I get a VUS is I dive into the literature. And I was wondering uh, how many physicians you think would do something like that and uh, if they should be expected to do something like that and uh, what might be some issues in that regard? Um, so I, I, uh, it's a good question and I don't know the answer how many do. I would like to think that um, when the VUSs are uh, in a um, domain that is related to the symptoms that the physician would um, feel that they need to at least understand what the clinical symptoms are that are associated uh, with those genes in order to make a judgment. Um, I don't know how many uh, physicians do that. Um, I think some feel more comfortable with genetics um, than others. Uh, sometimes uh, this is a good role um, for genetic counselors who are a um, very underappreciated resource um, who can be extremely helpful in reviewing and summarizing literature uh, regarding to, to specific genetic findings. Now, um, I think most physicians at least have some comfort level with genes that relate to disorders that they um, have seen. 
It becomes much more complex when they are genes that they have never seen, and even more complex when these variants are in specialties. Um, so for example, we may get variants returned um, uh, that may relate to some type of cardiac symptom that may be a bad thing for the patient. And I have no way of interpreting that. And so um, it's not clear how to handle those. Um, typically, we're referring off to cardiology, and um, they may or may not how know how to handle those things as well. Um, so it's, I think, an unexplored area, um, and uh, there aren't really good roadmaps for, for how to do this or who should be doing this. Um, uh, over time, hopefully, we'll, we'll have more guidance. And, and as time goes by, these variants, um, as we get more information, the uncertain significance will hopefully become less uncertain. Uh, I don't know how long that will take, but the more data we have, the less uncertainty we have uh, about these various variants. Do you think there are ways we should be supporting physicians better? And we, meaning the insurance companies, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I think that um, you know physicians are always short on time. That is, I, I, anybody who's been to the doctors, I think, can recognize that. And um, short on time and long on paperwork. Um, uh, whatever mechanisms that uh, can free up physician time will give them more time to devote to investigating these various variants. Um, physician extenders, um, genetic counselors, um, can uh, really provide a lot of uh, value to support physicians. But again, those things need to be paid for somehow. And a lot of insurance companies won't. Um, uh, so um, I think uh, once there are more mechanisms for uh, understanding the value of um, these types of supportive services, that will be of great benefit to, um, uh, to physicians. Um, you know, how can patients help their physicians um, be a, um, a collaborator in um, your physician's journey who may be learning about this as well? Um, and I think that uh, their um, patients can really be partners with their physicians to, to try to learn um, uh, when these things that are very uncertain come up. So I, I guess another question I would have, um, working in the genomics area myself, I often um, hear people talking about how uh, genomic information is different than other types of health information. Um, and there are many people who advocate that, you know, sort of this genetic exceptionalism um, type of stance. And then there are others who say, no, it's not really any different than other types of health information. And I was curious, um, you know, you put up all those other types of tests that patients had undergone, you know, prior to the sequencing. And um, how do you think sequencing compares to dealing with those other tests? Is it different? Is it, um, you know, is it not that different? What are your thoughts? Um, and I think another good question, and I think that uh, people, um, Thoughts regarding genetic exceptionalism, I think, are really evolving um, as we learn more and more about genetics, and genetics becomes more and more routine in the clinic. And I think the the origins of this um, stem from uh, probably back to Huntington's mm. disease, and which is a fatal neurodegenerative disorder that you can't do anything about. And so there have been a lot of guidelines um, uh, made out of experience with um, uh, not returning results to minors, um, not testing minors who are asymptomatic, um, and uh, really uh, counseling greatly um, before and after um, uh, providing uh, testing for this very very serious condition. And all of that, I think, is very important. Um, I think that um, as we evolve to uh, test for thousands of genes, I think that we need to use a little bit of judgment. I still think counseling before and after um, is uh, very important. Um, Sometimes that can be done by the physician, um, especially one who's knowledgeable about the testing. And so I don't know that we need to have um, 
co uh, in-depth counseling um, with a genetic counselor before and after every genetic test. We simply just don't have the resources for that. Um, uh, the, um, so I think there are many genetic tests that have evolved to um, be uh, much more akin to a routine test. Like you're getting a blood count um, and we have the results, it's positive or negative, and we report it that way without a lot of um, uh, discussion. But um, some results are very, very complex, as you saw with this exome. Um, many results um, uh, surrounding sequencing are unexpected. We wouldn't do sequencing if we knew where to look. And so it, it is a lot more complex, and a lot of the results, um, instead of being black or white, are probabilities. If you have this such and such a variant, you have an increased risk of whatever the disorder is. That is a very complicated concept to transmit, and that is where I would um, continue to advocate for genetic exceptionalism and thorough counseling and thorough discussions before and after return of results, um, more so than, say, a blood count. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. okay. So many issues that you brought yeah. up. Yeah. There, there are a lot. And oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there's so much to learn and so mm -hmm. many different paths to tread till we figure out. I don't know if we'll find the right way or one right way, but mm -hmm. yeah, and kind of going, taking a little bit further, the 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 issue of genetic exceptionalism. Is there any? And I don't have an answer. Is there any analogous situation in medicine to the VUS? Um, I think there are other situations in which we have uncertain results. Um, for example, we might have a chest x-ray that we're doing for a cough um, and we find uh, some sort of nodule that we're not sure what it is. Um, so there is a precedent in other types of testing, um, imaging types of testing, especially where um, there may be uncertain findings. Um, uh, different radiologists may look at the same, um, the same image and come up with a different answer based on their experience. Um, I think the difference perhaps is that um, for many of those, most of those scenarios that I can think of, there is a defined path for how to figure out what it is, um, biopsying it, for example, whereas we are still in the infancy with genetics, and so I think that there is this um, seemingly infinite time span until we really understand what some of these variants mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can. Um, just listening, it reminds me, I read, um, I remember reading a few years ago, uh, like an editorial from like the late 80s, I think, maybe it was sooner than that, on um, integration of routine um, prenatal ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And the author making an argument that, you know, uh, we, you know, we, there's no way we can have routine ultrasound. It would just provide way too much information that we don't understand, take up way f too much physician mm -hmm. time. Um, you know, would harm patients. Um, uh, of course, now we have routine ultrasound. <laughs> right, and that's, it's very interesting. And I mm -hmm. think the, the unknown is always scary. And um, I think history suggests that we will um, move in the direction of giving more mm -hmm. um, information and letting patients, um, uh, that patients can handle some degree of uncertainty, that we as physicians don't need to take a paternalistic view um, and protect them from their own information. Um, uh, but education is key, and um, I think it, uh, until um, patients' f understanding of genetics and genomics increases over time, providing them this information is, is quite difficult um, to transmit some of this information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But another question that, that I thought maybe you could say a little bit more about um, from your talk, you, especially since it was a pretty prominent issue with the second case, um, is this difference between what, what's, a, what's a research genome and what's a clinical genome? And, um, you know, perhaps uh, 
especially given this difference in consent that that occurred um, with the patient and in hindsight perhaps didn't want to get the results that she eventually got from the research genome. Um, can you say a little bit more about how that unfolded and um, what the ramifications were? So let me um, just start by um, clarifying it, because I don't know if everybody knows the difference between exome and genome. So um, exome, uh, both are sequencing um, all of our genetic material uh, with the exome um, focusing only on what we call the coding or what we think are the most important functional parts of our genetic material, whereas the genome is sequencing almost everything. Um, and there are thought to be um, uh, more areas that are irrelevant between genes that we are sequencing in the genome. Whether or not that's irrelevant you know, waits to be seen. But um, uh, so the exomes that we are doing, or sorry, the clinical tests that we are doing now, um, the vast majority are exomes, not genomes. Um, and um, for, for the first patient that I showed, she had a the twins had a research genome. Um, the second patients, they had a clinical exome first, followed by a research exome with a very, um, uh, almost a superficial genome. And so um, I'll, I'll um, just as a matter of terminology there. So I, to distinguish between the clinical tests and the research tests, um, Clinical tests are done in what is called a CLIA lab, a CLIA certified lab. These are labs that are, um, are governed by certain regulations as to how they run their tests, but also how those um, test results are interpreted and returned back. And there are certain guidelines um, that uh, need to be followed. And typically in a clinical lab, when looking at sequencing results, um, most labs are fairly conservative. So they are going to return back what they are certain of, and they are going to hold back those things that they are not certain of. Um, labs differ, so some labs are more conservative than others. In a research lab, the what is returned back really depends upon how that, whatever that research study was um, designed. And so there is the, the spectrum from returning absolutely nothing back to returning most things back. And that really depends on the investigator as well as the um, governing institutional mm -hmm. review board as to what can be returned back in a, in a research lab. Um, most research labs are going to try to return back only things that are relevant to the clinical presentation, just like the clinical lab. The difference that arose here was because we, the thinking can be a little bit more flexible in the research lab, and the research lab was looking for any plausible explanation to try to help our patient. And so that's why they were able to return that result back. Their consent form did not have, um, uh, would not have allowed return of off-target results, but they did not consider it an off-target result, which is why it was returned back. Mm -hmm. Does that clarify mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I think, and I think that leads in well to kind of one of the first topics that um, kind of came from all of you, which is the topic of uh, data sharing, and kind of the flow of data and um, related to how we interpret or can't interpret VUSs uh, in the first place. And so um, one question I think that came up for several people um, was just how best to share information regarding the genome, variants of unknown significance um, across clinics and across researchers. Um, so data sharing is really, really important. As I mentioned, the more we know, uh, the more we, s the more variants we see, the more we know how to interpret them. And this has been a great problem because this data is siloed in different labs, mm -hmm. in uh, different clinics, in different um, uh, clinical labs and research labs. And so there has been quite a um, 
push, um, and a, uh, government has established various um, databases where this data can um, be dumped. Um, a number of the clinical labs now are sharing their data and dumping their data in. Not every lab is. Um, uh, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think um, labs that receive NIH funding are mandated to um, deposit their data as well. Um, now, data, um, all data is not created equally, so um, having uh, genome sequencing information without knowing what the patients look like doesn't help so much. And so we really need the sequencing results paired with the clinical description of, of what the patients um, look like. Um, there, um, I, I won't mention company names, but I think there's been in the um, uh, news um, uh, stories about um, testing companies that uh, have um, not shared their data because it is proprietary and um, I, um, helps them to um, interpret their data better than, than another company. And so um, uh, outside individuals have taken it upon themselves to, um, I guess, free the data and encourage people to deposit their own data, um, which, which individuals can do um, uh, to try to get around this problem. So this is a big bottleneck for us now. I think many, many institutions are sequencing thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, and hopefully this problem will go away over time and hopefully quickly. Um, so we have a, a a series of questions related um, somewhat to a topic I brought up when we started, which was the issues around um, kind of burden on the physician um, and how to um, support physicians better. One question in particular, which I think is a little different than what we discussed, was how you think um, your preparation of new physicians. What, what do you see as um, uh, being um, should something change with respect to medical education? What's your view on that? Yeah, so clearly physicians need to be educated regarding genetics and genomics starting from the very beginning. Um, I think that is uh, happening or starting to happen, um, uh, not only in dedicated uh, genetics and genomics types of courses, um, but eventually this is going to be integrated um, into every field, and so hopefully there will be more and more exposure as they are seeing patients um, in the pulmonary clinic, in the, in the cardiology clinic, as it becomes integrated into clinical care. Um, and I think it is the next generation of physicians that will be much more facile with this information than the current um, generation of physicians, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, and uh, you know, there have been, um, to my knowledge, a couple of, as you said, I think there, there are a number of initiatives to increase physician education. Um, some novel ones, I know, I think Stanford had a program, at Mount Sinai's had a program where, uh, you know, the idea was that if physicians are um, sort of um, allowed to have their own genome sequence and participate in a very kind of hands-on course, you know, even I think at Mount Sinai, literally learn how to analyze a genome, get into some of the bioinformatics tools, um, you know, that, that that's perhaps an optimal way of doing it. You know, do you have a view on just how intense, I mean, there's many things you need to learn as a physician, right? right? right. Um, so how much, how much attention should genomics be given versus, you know, other sorts of things? And what specific things would you recommend? Well, I'm biased. I think it should be the <laughs> very, very heavy part of the, the curriculum. And um, I, as you know, I'm familiar with, with some of that. Um, uh, and I do think those courses are a great way. I think um, when it's personal, I think you, you really tend to to pay more attention to it. So um, it does, however, raise the same questions we raised here. And I know um, high, some high schools had actually considered uh, doing this type of a program and um, stopped for reasons that these, these are kids, they're not adults. Um, and learning uh, details about their genetics may not be something that they should be choosing before they're an adult. And so those same issues um, crop up in medical school. Now, these are adults. Um, 
uh, but um, giving them the opportunity to scour their own genomes um, uh, might, for some might be great, and for some might um, uncover some things they might not want to know. So I think that all of those things need to be taken into consideration, and perhaps um, if those types of courses are put forward, there needs to be some ability to mask um, certain genes so you can't look at certain ones if you don't want to. Um, but I think all of those considerations need to be um, put in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always thought it was a kind of a creative approach to it. In my mind, I, I thought, you know, do physicians have to go and undergo MRIs themselves to interpret a, an image or be in the hospital themselves <laughs> to treat well, a patient? Well, when I trained, we had to put <laughs> NG tubes down each other and art lines in each other. Um, I think that's all outlawed now, but, <laughs> but yes, we did. And I, um, uh, yeah, I gave someone a bloody nose doing that. So yes, it's, um, yeah, we, that's the way we used to see one, do one, teach one, mm -hmm. is the kind of the old um, philosophy with regard to learning medicine. So I think this falls right mm -hmm. into that. Great. Um, so the next set of questions, we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but the next set of questions does, uh, there's a series of them on reimbursement and insurance. Um, which you referred to a number of times. And in fact, each of the three categories of questions you had, I think the last one for each one, and who pays, right? Should we reanalyze and who pays, and so on. Um, so maybe you could, uh, to my knowledge, you know, some insurance companies are covering some you know, sequencing for some purposes. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. So I, I have been pleasantly surprised that I have had very good luck um, getting sequencing, exome sequencing covered for um, most of my patients. Um, uh, but I understand that is not the experience um, broadly, and I'm not quite sure why I've had better luck than most. Um, the exceptions to that are the um, uh, most of the government insurance um, where it, it's virtually impossible um, to get it covered. Um, the, um, uh, I, I think that because I'm sequencing children, I think that, that um, uh, these are children with devastating disorders. I think that that maybe uh, has something to do with why it's being covered. Um, and I, I, again, have been um, pleasantly surprised by many of the private, um, uh, especially PPO's um, uh, willingness to approve. Um, uh, now there's still a big copay for patients sometimes, um, uh, but um, I, for, our, for me, it's not been that difficult for those with um, private insurance. Some of the, as I said, some of the public has been more difficult, more challenging. I hope you all uh, were able to get as much out of um, the discussion tonight as I have. So many issues that arise when we try to take um, an emerging uh, complex technology like genomics and move it into another complex area, which is clinical care. And um, I think it just gave us a great um, uh, exposure to many of the issues that come up. And with that, I'd just really like to thank our speaker and thank you all for coming.